Father God, I thank You so much for today. Lord, I thank You for just just what's been a powerful day. And I, I just... I thank You for the ways in which You move in people's lives and the power in which You reveal Your body to the world. Lord, as we go through a season where we remember Your promise to come and You came and and Lord, You promised to come again. We sing those words. All the earth and all creation and all the moon and the stars will, will sing praises to You, Lord, when You come and just glory in the highest. What, a, what an amazing thing it is to, to be a part of that. So Lord, I thank You because we're not a part of it because of anything we've done. It's just grace. It's Your mercy and it's what You've done. So Lord Jesus, we praise You. We ask as we come before Your Word today that Lord, use it with power over our lives. Help us to continue to be transformed into the people that you've called us to be. Help us to be more and more like you and reflectors of your image. Lord, we praise your name. It's in your name we pray, Lord. Amen. Well, we're continuing our Advent series. We are into week two uh, on Advent. Now, if you uh, come from a church where maybe you've had Advent experiences before, you're probably unless you're new here, you're probably not that surprised that our approach to Advent is a little different, which is okay. We don't have any candles up here, and we don't do some things that a lot of churches do, and there's nothing wrong with what they do. Um, but the whole point of Advent, and the reason why we take a slightly different approach to Advent, is because it's just like anything else in church. It can be repetitious. And somewhere in the midst of doing something, we can completely miss its point. I grew up in a church for 18 years. I saw him do Advent, and I never really fully got it. Of course, that was me more than anything else. But the point is, is that Advent, we want to take an approach where we talk about what is, what is real. Now, of course, we have a theme this Advent season, and we're focusing on the incarnation. And what does that mean? Just like last week, we talked about this idea that people are looking, when they talk about God, when they talk about God, there's kind of this element of God where we just kind of dismiss everything to faith. And, and that, that's good, but, but the question is, what, what are the areas where we are to have faith, and what are the areas to where we're not to have faith? I mean, do we have to have faith to believe that Jesus exists? Do we have to just trust that it's all true and kind of bootstrap ourselves and try to do whatever it is that we're supposed to do? Is that Christianity? The, the incarnation of Christ, God becomes man. And we talked about last week, it's this idea that God became skin. He became flesh. He became something that people could interact with, touch. God left his position in heaven. Jesus didn't, didn't begin in the first Christmas. That's not when he started. He was eternal. He was God forever. He was in this beautiful place before the first Christmas, when, whenever that was. We, it wasn't December the 25th, zero. Okay, so we don't know exactly when it is. But we do Advent at a time. We set aside a date to remember that Christ became Jesus, the Son, God Himself became flesh. So we set that aside. We precede it with a season called Advent. Advent basically means arrival. It's this, it's, we prepare our hearts and our minds for the coming of Christ, the first coming, and we also have this promise of the second coming. You know, we sang that song, Glory in the Highest, and you know, we, sing that, we sing that beautiful bridge and all the earth will sing your praise, the moon and stars, the sun, you know, all these, these things, all of creation uh, is singing the praise. That's on the return of Christ. It, it paints this picture. So we're focusing on the incarnation, God becoming flesh, so that people could, could relationally connect to God. 
Last week we talked about incarnational living, uh, which is not channeling, it's not becoming God, but it's living relationally. It's this idea of putting yourself in a position to bridge a relational gap. And so that's kind of the power of the incarnation. We were helpless in our existence, and then, and then God came in the flesh to make a way to restore our relationship with him. Now, we talked last week about how, uh, and, and I'll use myself as an example. I grew up in church. I went through all the Christmas stuff. I even participated in all the little Christmas plays and everything we did as kids, which are really cute and wonderful, and I love those things. I was a participant in all of that. But even I will admit that after I went, even though I went through all of that stuff, it never really hit home for me. There was a part in my life where, uh, you know, one day, I, I, and of course I'm just sharing, maybe you can relate, maybe you can't, but just for uh, the sake of, of kind of setting up where we're going today, um, there was a part of me that really, really struggled with the whole point, why, why did God do things the way that he did? I mean, wouldn't it, make a, wouldn't it be a lot easier for people to believe in Jesus if he was still around? I mean, if he's eternal, why did he leave? What, you know, what, what's the, what, and, and see, these are the kind of questions I ask. And of course, you know, the, the religious response is, well, you just got to have faith. That's just the way it is. That's not the right answer. If Jesus isn't here, and if there's a part of us that wants something to connect to, why isn't he? Is there something else? And see, this is where we're going to go today as we, as we study the incarnation and we study about people being able to see Jesus. I will tell you right now, I'm going to tell you how to see Jesus today. If you are in your life and you think, oh, you know what, I really want to see Christ. I just like to see him. I'm going to tell you you can. And I'm going to tell you exactly how to do it. But I will also tell you that most of you, or maybe not most, but at least some of you, won't do it it's it's easy but yet it's impossible but i'm going to tell you how to do it i'm going to tell you that there is a way for us those of us that want to see jesus we will see him i want to show you this into a text i want to uh, take you to john 14 starting with verse 18 jesus is writing to his disciples and he says to them he says, no, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. It says, soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Since I live, you will also live. When I am raised to life again, you will know that I am in my Father. You are in me, and I am in you. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them, and I will love them and reveal myself to each of them some translations say manifest i will show myself to them i remember years and years ago when i first started coming to to be starting to move into that place where i was getting ready to surrender my life to christ this was the text that knocked me off my shoes and i remember as i read that i thought to myself you know that's either true or it isn't we live in a post christendom culture where a lot of people 50 years ago had to go to church. It was just part of the expectation. 50 years ago, you walked around, you talked to people. It wasn't a question of where do you go to or It wasn't a matter of do you go to church. It was a matter of where. It was assumed that everybody went to church. Was everybody saved? Somewhere along the line, the church shifted from a thing that is God, an organic representation of God, to a building. Somewhere along the line, the, you know, we, we, we kind of lost sight of the truth. And we adopted this consumer Christian mentality, which means that people come to church for themselves. And it's all about us. And so we have this idea that I'm coming in, and it's almost like I'm going to a movie. I, my, my offering is my payment. 
It's all based on the level to which I'm, I receive something. We kind of have this consumer mentality. There's certain things about this I don't like, so let's just jettison that. Let's just, let's just kind of move towards the feel-good piece of it. Let's do all this. Let's do all that. But can I tell you, if that's your mindset, you'll never see Jesus. And so we live in a society where people claim to be Christians. And, and there's, there's a superficiality to it. I want to show you, Steve, could you pull up that, that picture of that headline that you downloaded? Obviously, we had terrible events in California this week, and, and uh, some of you may be familiar with them, and if you're not, I don't know where you've been. But we had this terrible tragedy where this, this, this couple that, obviously, that, that, that they went on a killing rampage in, in, in California, and well, anyway, the, the New York Daily News, the Daily Times, they come out with this headline. Uh, a lot of people, their response to tragedy said, well, we're going to pray for the victims, and we're going you know, to pray about this. And, and they came up with a headline that basically said, God can't fix this. And so it, it, can I tell you what the underlying implication in that is? Their idea of God fixing such, a, such an event is that as the gun as the gun gunman got out of the car that God would somehow come down from heaven appear before the gunman and turn their guns into flowers or something I mean God directly has to take action but but see the problem is they, they don't know what to look for because can I tell you where I saw God in this I saw it immediately I saw that video of that police officer that was that was escorting people to safety and he said to him relax I'll take a bullet before you do see I see that and I see God now I don't know if that person knew I don't know if that police officer I, I don't know but that that's God what where does a person say you know what I'll die before you do I don't even know you but if, if they come around that corner I'm going to throw myself in the path of that bullet so that you may live and I don't even know who you are and you know what, it doesn't matter because I'm going to sacrifice for you. Where does that come from? That's not, it's not typical. So we have this thing that exists. We have this situation. We have evil. We have bad things happening. But even in the midst of that, if you know what to look for, you're going to see God. Or not. So what we're going to do, we're going to show, I'm going to show you what to look for. So here we go. Let's go to our text today. We're going to be in Colossians. We're going to be starting with Colossians chapter 1. And it begins as we, as we start, we start uh, verse 15, and it says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. I want to stop right there. We, again, last week we started talking about how God became skin for people. He became visible. So that people could see and relate to him. That's as we start to unpack this idea of who Jesus is. Fully God, fully man. Fully God in a, in a man package. That's the power of the incarnation. But what does it mean to be a visible image? There's kind of two pieces to this. And I want to kind of explain it to you. On the one hand... To be a visible image is to be an exact representation. For example, if you look into a mirror, you see yourself, you see an image, which is the exact representation of who you are. So on this hand, as they describe Jesus, he's the visible image of the invisible God. He is the full, exact image of God. So for example... Do you ever ask yourself questions? Well, I wonder if God cries when I'm sad. Did Jesus? I wonder if God laughs. Did Jesus? I wonder if God ever gets angry at things or, you know, whatever. Did Jesus? We look, you know, did, did Jesus, was Jesus, uh, is God ever filled with, un, for, is God ever filled with forgiveness and mercy? Well, was Jesus? It's amazing to me. Uh, you know, sometimes we get this idea in churches how God was emotionless and always serious. 
Was Jesus that way? Did Jesus walk around, uh, did, you know, did he kind of walk around stoic and pious? And he looked at people and he talked with his pious voice. Beest art thou, will I? Right? So we have this image of God, who's Jesus. He, what, he, what he revealed to us about God is the part of God that we can connect to. He became the connectable part to God. Because remember, Romans chapter 1, we, we've traded truths about God for lies. In our fallen state, we become disconnected with God. We don't know who he is anymore, so we've forgotten who God is. So God, throughout Scripture, is kind of revealing himself to us. And then all of a sudden, boom, here comes God in the flesh. Here I am. There's no other religion that even comes close to this. We have instances in religions where, where God revealed himself to a person on a mountaintop. And then that person came and told everybody about it. But only in the truth of Jesus Christ do we have the instance where God became flesh and He Himself spoke the words, He talked to people, He interacted with people, and He revealed God to people. Folks, that is the truth about Jesus. That's one part of it. The second part of it is we have, uh, in, in, in the account of creation, we have in the Word of God the Trinity talking, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and they say to themselves, let us make man in our image. What does that mean? Does that mean we can become little gods? No. But it does mean that we have attributes of God. It does mean that I can represent God. For example, my kids are kind of a representative image of Vicky and I. They're not us. They're not the same as us. They have their own personalities, uniqueness, but they have attributes. Sometimes people will say to me, you know what, Steve, you're the spitting image of your dad. Right? My dad and I are very different, but yet we have attributes that are similar. You see, when... when so, so here as we talk about an image, it means kind of a reflection, a representation. So in this case, Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. He's the fullness of God. But bear in mind what that word image means. It can also mean a representation of God. So that's going to be important because as we go further, the question is how do people see Jesus? We're going to keep answering that question. So it goes on. It says, He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. Some translations say that He was first born. And this is kind of where people get the misunderstanding that Jesus was created. It's because they don't understand what first born means. It means that, that it, in, in this particular case, they had a cultural understanding. It was something. The first born had the authority of the Father. So if you walked into a situation, you said, hi there, I'm Steve, the firstborn of Bruce, then automatically the, represent, the, the understanding of the people I say that to, by the way, I'm not the firstborn, so I have no authority of Bruce, but the point, <laughs> the point is, is that it was a language back then that if I said such a thing, people would say, oh, you're representing your father. Yes. I'm the representative of my father. And so that's where this whole firstborn discussion comes from. It says that he is supreme over all creation. Now, sometimes we hear this expression, the only begotten son of God. What does that mean? It means that he was unique. So what we're going to do as we go forward is we're going to see we're going to see similarities and, and we're going to draw a, a kind of a common thread between the incarnation of Christ and how God can reveal himself to people. But one of the things we have to understand is that Jesus was unique. We, Jesus was fully God and fully man. We will never become God. Never. But that doesn't mean 
that we can't reflect God. Or it doesn't mean that we can't show people God through our lives. So we're going to have to, we're going to walk this tightrope and we're going to have to understand and you have to know that in no way, because some, some people believe this. They believe that Jesus was like this enlightened individual that by virtue of his intelligence, goodness, and actions, that he basically achieves God status. That's a heresy, it's a lie, it's not true. He was God. But that doesn't mean that as we become Christians, little Christ, that, that, that we are not being conformed into the image of Christ. So, so we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna walk that line between the two. So we're, we'll keep going forward. It says in verse 16, For through him God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. All things were created by Jesus. Now you may not believe that. And we live in a day and age where you're told anything but that. Well, you know, it was, it was a big bang theory. It was, it was just random occurrences in nature and, you know, just whatever. God based, or maybe God just sat back and watched going, well, I wonder what's going to happen there. They paint this picture that everything was created by him and for him. Now, you don't have to believe that if you don't want to, but I could, I'll tell you, if you do, it'll start to change your outlook of everything, especially yourself. One of the things that is just crazy to me is how, you know, people today, they love, they love how to talk about how you know, they, you know, science about how we just evolved and, and, you know, the Big Bang Theory and all this stuff. Do you know what the fruit of all that is? Is people feel insignificant. If I'm just some random accident, if I am not a carefully thought out plan, then what difference do I make? It, it changes your value. If if, if, you just, if you start to understand that you were made by Jesus, for Jesus, now in our brokenness, we don't live that way. We don't, we don't honor Him. We don't remember Him. We don't seek to, 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 to kind of live this way. We kind of tend to, to drift off into areas of error, Right? But if you want to get back on track, it starts by understanding that, you know what, my whole purpose of existence is to glorify God. It's to honor Him with the way that I live my life. And, and, and it just starts to change our mindset. It starts to change who we are. I see so many people, especially during Christmas, that are discouraged, they're depressed, and they're kind of in that place where it's like, there's got to be more to life than this. Yes, there is. There is more to life. You were created by Jesus, for Jesus. Are you living that way? Are you buying the lies that tell you you don't mean anything? You're, you're just an accident. You're just a random occurrence in nature. It's only blind luck that you are here now. Or do you believe? Jesus knew, Jesus created me. I was created by him and for him. Doesn't mean you're living for him, but it doesn't change the fact of why you're here. We go on, it says that he made the things we can see and the things we can't see. There are things in this world we can't see. And it's, we, we may think, well, that's not fair, but you know what? It's for our best. You know, as I was praying through this and I was thinking about this, I was thinking, because, you know, there's a part of me, I just want to see. I want to, you know, I want to know. Have you ever prayed that prayer, Lord, let me see into the spiritual world. I want to see. I want to see the angels. I hear, I see people in Scripture, they see the angels, and I want to see it. And, and, you know, and I know people that sometimes can see that stuff, but I never, ever have. Why is it so difficult? Well, as I was praying to this and I was thinking about this, God kind of gave me this idea. It's kind of like welding. Anybody who welds knows that you can't stare at the light. It's too intense. It's too powerful. If you stare at the light, it's going to burn your retinas. You, don't, you can't physically look at the light. 
it's, it's, just, it's just too much. So what do you do? Well, you have to somehow hide the light or look away. The reason why we can't see into the spiritual world, it's actually mercy from God. If you could see, it'd blow you away. We have glimpses in Scripture, and every so often we hear people that, that actually get a glimpse of heaven. But you know, if we saw it in all of its fullness, we cannot, we can't physically look at it yet. But that doesn't change the fact that they're there. He says that He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Let's go back to the shooters in California. Why on earth would anybody do that? So you have all these people sitting back going, that doesn't make any sense. Why on earth would anybody do that? It's evil. It doesn't make any sense. There's evil in this world. There are powers and there are, there's evil. And, and, and so we have evil all over the place. This world is a fallen world. And sometimes people say, well, I can't believe such evil things happen. Do you want to know the truth? I can't believe it doesn't happen more. Have you ever stopped to think? See, this, this is why if you ever become a pastor or you dive into things and you change your worldview, it, everything changes. I, you know, sometimes I've, I've sat there in situations. Like, for example, a football game. 70,000 fans going crazy. But are they really going crazy? Are they just excited? What if actually 10% of that 70,000 decided all of a sudden to actually go crazy? Where they actually did whatever they wanted and they, they completely, they did whatever they wanted and they did whatever they wanted to whomever they wanted. And they didn't listen to law or order. They didn't obey anything. And, you know, what keeps them from doing that and what would, what would stop them ultimately from doing that? We are constantly being protected by God, and we don't even realize it. You know, there, at, 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 any given, at any given game, what are there, maybe 20 police officers? Maybe, a, you know, another, maybe another 20 security officers? If 7,000 people all of a sudden decided to do whatever they wanted, do you think those 40 people are going to stop them? What about if all of a sudden, let's just say that starting tomorrow... Everybody decided, let's say 10% of the people who drive decide to completely disregard the traffic laws. Let's say that 10% of all drivers just start driving however they want to. Do you think we have enough police officers to stop that? What, what, what holds it together? Well, common sense. No. If we all had common sense, then we wouldn't go on shooting rampages. There's something that holds us together. And we're going to talk about that. Let's keep going. It said, everything was created through Him and for Him. Verse 17, He existed before anything else, and He holds all creation together. So even though we see all kinds of evil, terrible things, simultaneously we have people like that police officer running into danger saying relax i'll take a bullet before you do now you can see it or not see it it's up to you you can go through life and you can say oh well you know god's asleep at the wheel is he really i tell people all the time i thank god for emergency responders not just police officers, EMTs, paramedics, firefighters, all these people that when, when people are running away because they're terrified, there's always people willing to go towards danger. Military, people that serve the public, people that put themselves in places. Imagine just for a minute that those people aren't there. Those people represent God. And we can either see it or not see it. But just for a minute, imagine society without Him. We keep going on. It says that Christ is also the head of the church, which is His body. Now we're getting to the place. We live in the age where Jesus, He came and He's coming again in body. 
But can we see him today? The answer is yes. How? Through the church. This is where our mindset, our consumer church mindset, it's not conducive to the truth. Because people come to church and it's all about them. You know, this is what I want. I'm going to come to church if it's convenient for me. I'm going to participate in church if, if it's convenient. I'm going to give if it's convenient. But the truth of the matter is that Jesus, the way that people see Jesus today that don't know him, is supposed to be through the church, the body of Christ. The reason why so many young people were disenfranchised in our society today and they have this really poor view of church today, they, they don't necessarily have a, a, a poor view of Jesus. They have a poor view of church. And the reason why is because, I'll just tell you, they see all these people that are supposed to be professing one thing, living another. And their, and their take back from that is, you know what, I don't need it. And so you have a lot of people today that profess to be Christians that think the church is stupid. But I'll tell you what, here's the danger in that. You can walk up to me and say, hey Steve, you know what, I really like you, but I can't stand your wife. Guess what, we got a problem. Because she's my bride. I love her. The church is the bride of Christ, the body of Christ. You can't love Jesus and hate the body. You can't do it. So he says, he says that, that Christ is the head of the church, which is his body. He's the beginning, supreme over all, all who rise from the dead. So he is the first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. If you want to know God, you look at Jesus. He goes on to say, And through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Can I just interject? Every year I tell you this, it's a pet peeve of mine. I see secular uh, Christmas displays that will say something like, Peace on earth, goodwill towards man. <laughs> Boy, is that annoying. And I'll tell you why. Because the implication of that is that you, you just need to be on... It, 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 the whole thing, peace on earth, goodwill towards men, has everything to do with God. It doesn't have anything to do with us and the way we interact with each other. I, you know, whether or not you and I are at peace, I would like to be, but if not, hey, you know what? May, maybe we can reconcile, maybe we can't. But if I'm not at peace with God, that's kind of a big deal. If you take Jesus out of the peace on earth, goodwill towards men, it doesn't make any sense. The point is, is that Jesus coming in the flesh, part of what he came for was to make God known to people, but he was to create peace between God and man because there was a hostility that, that was there between us. And for some of you, that hostility is there. Do you really want to surrender your life to God and trust Him? Or are you kind of just doing it on your own and hoping He'll show up when it's convenient for you? Too many people today, they'll come to me and, you know, they have this knowledge of Jesus. And I don't know, I don't know if they're saved or not, but I can tell you they're not surrendered. And there's a disconnect. There's something wrong. Something doesn't make sense to them, and they're, they're asking questions. Well, why is this happening? Well, are you, really, are you really surrendered to Christ? Because you see, the way that this all happens, the way that this all comes to pass, you can't be halfway in and do it. You don't have to be perfect to do it. You don't have to get it right all the time, but your heart and your mind need to be surrendered. If you, if you want what the Scriptures offer, if you want this for your life, you have got to be surrendered. It goes on to say that, it says that through Him God reconciled everything to Himself. He made peace with everything in heaven on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Here's the reality. 
I needed a sacrifice for my sins against God. I needed somebody. It, it was a debt that I myself could not pay. Jesus came. God became flesh. He never sinned. He is the only person that ever got all of this right. If anybody had a reason to be self-righteous, it was Jesus, right? That's kind of a theological joke. But the point of it all is, is that, yes, you know, we read all this, and all we hear is, yeah, you, you don't make it, you don't qualify, you don't, you don't belong. Uh, you know what, if it were up to you, you wouldn't, it wouldn't happen. Uh, you, it, it's no good, you can't do it, you're not good enough, uh, you know, and all this stuff. But then we miss the piece where Jesus was. Christianity is not about behavior modification. It is about reconciliation between God and man. Verse 21, this includes you who were once far away from God. You were His enemies, separated from Him by your evil thoughts and actions. Am I willing to go there within myself and admit that some of my thoughts and my actions are evil? Or do I want to just pretend, no, 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 that's not the case. This is where people wrestle with God, is they think that man has somehow morally evolved beyond God. And then what is the result? We live apart from God. It's only when we surrender to Him. You know, I, I uh, kind of an interesting just thought, and this is just kind of, this, this will kind of give you insight into how, kind of how goofy I am, I guess I could say. <laughs> but I deal, with a, I deal with a lot of things and a lot of situations. And, and you know, I'm always constantly trying to gain perspective, things that give me encouragement, that, that help get my mind right when it comes to Christ. And, you know, I read a text like this and I think about that. And here, here's what I think of. I think of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. And I think of, you know, because you, you may not know this, but that's a Christian allegory. It's Tolkien was a Christian. I, many of you know that, but some of you may not know that. But you look at this and you see, you see all these evil, demonic creatures. And you see these noble human beings. And, and you know, kind of what I think what a lot of people take a look at is they sit there and they say, well, you know, human beings are the noble ones in the movie and, and all that stuff. But, you know, you know, the way that I look at it is that as I watch this movie, before Jesus came into my life, I would have been... I would have been like one of the orcs of the Urukai. This evil creature that, that was willing to consume others to, you know, to serve evil and to do these things. And, and maybe not to the extent of some people. And I know there are levels of this. But I know my heart. I know what I was into. I know what sometimes I still wrestle with. And I know it's very easy for me to go through life and not give honor and glory to God. But when you understand that Jesus, He came in, He did this for us when we were God's enemies. We don't think of ourselves as enemies to God. But when we dishonor our Creator, when we live, just we thumb our noses at the Word of God, if we don't care then we are being enemies of God. But listen to this. It says, it says that evil thoughts and actions, yet now He has reconciled you to Himself through the death of Christ in His physical body. As a result, He has brought you into His own presence. And you are holy and blameless as you stand before Him without a single fault. Can I tell you that as a Christian, whether or not Jesus was real, left the faith station for me a long time ago. I don't struggle with that. You want to know what I struggle with? Is this. I'm holy and blameless? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me, God? That, that even though there was a time in my life, and sometimes even today, that I do things that dishonor you, you still have made a way for me to not hide from you in shame. You've made a way for me to feel beloved and a part of the body of Christ, a part of what Jesus is doing. 
Are you kidding me? I see people today that want to kill themselves because they feel so insignificant and they feel so ashamed and they feel so broken. And listen to this. You were made by Jesus, for Jesus. He died for you so that you could stand before God holy and blameless. That's a big deal, folks. That's massive. And if you don't understand that, and if it doesn't knock you right down to your socks, that you are missing something, and you don't get Christmas. You don't get it. And you're going to get sucked in to everything else, and when Christmas is over, you're going to be left empty. Going, well, no big deal. goes on to say in verse 23, you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. This is where the battle of faith comes in. Do you think Satan wants people living in that redeemed and blameless place? Or do you think he's going to come at you and try to get you ashamed to back off and to literally drift away? Let me tell you a little theological truth. You know, a lot of people think that just because I made a prayer or I said something at a church service that I'm saved. Can can I just interject something here? The only way that you can be assured that you're saved is that you continue to believe. You know what? When people come forward and they profess Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, I think it's great. And I praise the Lord for it. But you know what? I've got to be honest with you. There's a part of me that says, well, we'll see. You don't get saved by saying a prayer. There's nothing wrong with saying a prayer. I think it's great. I think it's wonderful. And matter of fact, if you come to me and you say, I want to be saved, we'll pray a prayer together. But then it's like, how are you going to live your life? Are you going to walk with faith? Are you going to believe? Are you going to surrender your life to Jesus? Are you going to be a part of the body of Christ? God has given me this responsibility of serving the church by proclaiming his entire message to you. This message was kept secret for centuries and generations past, but now it's been revealed to God's people. God wanted them to know that the riches and glory of Christ are for you Gentiles too. This is the secret. Christ lives in you. Do you believe it? Or is he out here somewhere? Christ lives in you. This gives you assurance of sharing in his glory. How do you know if you're saved? Because Jesus is in here doing something. He's in here compelling you and working on you and helping you to be more and more like him so that you can be image bearers of God. And so now people who don't know him can see God through you. It goes on to say, so we tell others about Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all the wisdom God has given us. We want to present them to God perfect, mature in their relationship to Christ. That's why I work and I struggle so hard, depending on Christ's mighty power that works within me. We tell others about Christ. As we talk about the incarnation, as we come before the communion table, and we talk about the body and the blood of Christ, there's all this that it just, I don't know whether or not you see it. But it's kind of one of those things where once you do, you just want to go, duh. It's been in front of me all this time. You know, people, you think, you think okay, so we have, all, we have all this talk. Jesus, the visible image of the invisible God. The Holy Spirit lives in you. Jesus says, I'm going to reveal myself to you. And Christ is in us. And we're doing this work through the body, the church. We have the body and the blood of Christ. Do you think that God doesn't want to be known? Do you think that God wants to sit back and say, well, <laughs> it's a big puzzle. If you can figure it out, good luck. 
He's shouting. He's saying, here I am. Here I am. Come to me. Be a part of my body. I came. I died for you. you. This is an invitation. You don't have to earn it. You can't earn it. But you do have to come. You have to believe. You have to trust me. You have to surrender. You cannot make room for something until you empty it first, right? Well, you can't make room for Jesus until you empty yourself of yourself. And that's just the way it is. So as we go into communion and we talk about the body and the blood of Christ and we talk about being filled with Christ, it starts with you emptying yourself. If you want to see Jesus, start with yourself. And from there, others can see Christ in you. So communion is this, is this beautiful gift that Jesus Christ himself gave us. It is this, this wonderful sacrament in which by partaking in communion, we don't gain a relationship with Jesus, but we do enhance one that already exists. No, no work will save you. So if you're here today and you're like, well, I want to know Jesus, so I'm going to take communion, it doesn't work that way. If you do know Jesus and you want to know more of him and you want to experience greater, greater uh, uh, presence of him in your life, then God has given us communion to remember him so that he can continue to grow deeper and deeper in our lives. That's what the Holy Spirit does. So we're going to pray, and we're going to move into a time of communion. And I want to ask you that before you come forward, we're going to have the ushers uh, dismiss you from the back forward. And before you come forward, I just want you to kind of come before God and ask him that question, Lord, what do I need to empty of myself in order to make more room for you? So would you pray with me, please, as we go into communion together? Father God, I thank you for your word today. Lord, I do thank you that you did not abandon us as orphans, but that you come to us. That when we love you and we obey you, Lord, you reveal yourself to us. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you for reconciling us to God. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for by virtue of your sacrifice, putting us in a position of holiness and blamelessness. So Lord, as we enter into this time of communion, I pray that you would bless it and use it to grow our faith in you and help us be your body so that others can see you as well. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. So I had a leadership team meeting not too long ago. And in there, I gave, I gave the leaders some homework to do. And I'm going to give you the same homework that I gave them. And you can choose whether or not you want to do it. It's up to you. But what kind of an impact would it have on our community if everybody in this room made a resolution that I resolve to put myself in a place to where God can use me to touch somebody else. What if you did that? Are your hearts and minds ready? Are you ready to be skinned for God? To, to somehow show God to somebody who doesn't know them? Well, I challenged the leaders. I gave them two weeks. I said, you go out and you ask God to put you in a place to where you can be God for others. And I can't wait to hear the stories. So are you willing to do that? Are you willing to overlook your own self-interest this holiday season? Are you willing to be a servant for Jesus? Are you willing to show a lost world a little glimpse of what God looks like because He lives in you? If you do that, I would love to hear the stories. I'd love to hear what Jesus is doing through you. So please, pray about that. Put yourself, challenge God, ask Him. He'll do it. He'll do it. He'll give you eyes to see. And He'll give you the power to be His representative.
So, please stand. Receive this blessing. I want to dismiss you now. As you leave today, and as you pray about this, should you choose to accept this mission, I pray that in the midst of that, you'll leave here now knowing the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the Son, and the fellowship and the power of the Holy Spirit now and always. God bless you. You're dismissed. Go be light and have a good week.